Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the recording of our 10 Steps to User-Friendly Design session from Tableau Conference. Uh, Kate and I are super excited to chat with you today and take you through our 10 steps. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I just want to remind everybody that Salesforce is a publicly traded company and customers should base their purchasing decisions on products and services that are currently available. We also want to give a quick shout out and thank you to everybody that attended one of our two sessions in person. Uh, it was a really exciting week and we appreciate everybody that took time out of their busy schedules to join us in person. All right, so to introduce my co-presenter today, this is Kate Soika. Uh, she's a lead trainer at Lovelytics and a Tableau certified instruct, uh, instructor. She actually worked at Tableau for two and a half years before joining us at Lovelytics. Uh, she works with uh, the others on the Austin Tableau user group advisory board. And outside of work, she enjoys bouldering, caring for her houseplants, and spending time outside with her husband, Ben, and their dog, Ruby. Definitely hit up Kate if you have some questions about uh, taking care of your houseplants. She has saved quite a few of mine. Awesome, and please allow me to introduce y'all to Eric Bolish, Manager of Data Visualization at Lovelytics, making Eric not only my friend, but also my boss. Eric is a three-time Tableau Public Ambassador, has three vis of the days. He generously donates his time as a trainer with the nonprofit Millennials and Data. He's the founder of Back to Viz Basics and is fiance to the wonderful Olivia and dog dad to their standard poodle, Loki. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kate. A uh, quick little snippet about Lovelytics. Uh, we're a data and analytics strategy services and solutions company based out of Arlington, Virginia, but we have a ton of employees around the US and Canada. Uh, we've been a data services partner with Tableau since 2017, and we were actually named the Tableau 2020 Rising Partner of the Year and the Databricks 2021 Innovation Partner of the Year. Um, so just if you have any questions about our services and what we do, we'd love to, to chat more. All right, let's get into the fun stuff. So here's our agenda. This is our 10 step checklist that we're gonna take you through today. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through a fake client scenario with a dashboard that looks okay, but we're gonna see how we can take this dashboard through each one of these steps and improve upon it. So by the end, we're gonna have a product that looks a lot better and a lot more user friendly. So we're um, that's gonna be our plan for today. We're gonna go over some several key concepts in each step, uh, but please note that uh, while every dashboard is different, we're going to cover the ones that are specific to the dashboard that we're talking about. But it's important to consider these key concepts um, throughout the whole data visualization process. All right, so let's get started. Here's our client scenario. Dear Tableau conference goers or our virtual, virtual listeners right now, uh, we need your help. We built a set of professional services suite dashboards, but we need them to look modern and cool. I'm sure a lot of us have heard that before where they want our dashboards to look like Google or Apple or you know modern and cool, right? Uh, we want them to follow our brand guidelines and be interactive and user friendly. We need them as soon as possible. So we're probably on the hook for getting them done as of yesterday. Can you help us? And we all say yes. So let's take a look at the dashboard. Here it is right here. Now, overall, this looks okay. We have some nice layouts to it. Everything appears to be in a, a nice structure. Looks like we're pulling in some important information that is displayed in a, a meaningful way, but there's just a few things that are a little off. So let's see how we can take this dashboard through our 10-step checklist and improve upon it. So number one, order by importance. Here are our key concepts. So order from top to bottom and left to right. Keep your most important or aggregated information on the top and your less important and more granular information on the bottom. Consolidate your headers for smoother readability and place supporting items close to related. So first and foremost, order from top to bottom and left to right. Within the boxes on the dashboard, those are kind of the areas that I'm talking about based off of what's highlighted in dark on the left-hand side. So you can kind of follow along in that way. Uh, but first, right, we have our logo in the top left, our navigation objects and download objects across the top. We have kind of that side panel where we're gonna maybe put some navigation or some filters, or in this case, we're putting some supporting information. And then we have the bulk of our dashboard uh, in the center part. So, right, we wanna think about ordering from um, most important to least important. So as we go into our next step, our next key concept, we have our KPIs across the top. We have our title next to it, so we're actually gonna update that. It, it doesn't fit well next to our, our KPIs. But then from there, we wanna look at every chart and figure out what's most important. So in this case, looking at my conversions per month area chart in the bottom right, I actually think that that chart is more important to my stakeholders. stakeholders. So in a minute, we're gonna move that to the top. 
right? We want to think about putting our KPIs always across the top or down the left-hand side because that's where they communicate the most meaning that they're important. If we put them down the right-hand side or at the bottom, we're not communicating that they're important to our stakeholder because those are the numbers that they care most about. Place supporting items close to related. So in this case, right, every time we drag out a worksheet onto a dashboard, Tableau automatically groups our filters into a container on the right-hand side. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Uh, but I just want to make sure that those filters are being applied to the whole dashboard. So if they're going to be on uh, across the top or in a container going down the left-hand side or the right-hand side, we want to make sure that we're communicating to our users that those filters filter the whole dashboard. If they only filter one chart, we probably want to put them closer to that chart. So looking at the conversions per webinar chart in the top left, where I have the top five highlighted, that parameter only pertains to that chart. So that's why I have it in the same line as the title and grouped close to my chart. If I had that on the left-hand side with my other filters and I changed that parameter to, let's say, the top 10, but only one chart updated, it's going to be confusing to my user. So I want to make sure that I'm putting all of those items that are related to charts close to it. The same goes for my information icons and my week and month buttons on the, the bottom left chart and the, the other two. So those information icons specifically apply to those charts. So when I hover over it, it's probably giving me some uh, other information about those charts that I'm not seeing or understanding by just looking at it. So if we apply these key concepts to our dashboard, this is what it could look like. So what we've done is we've moved our conversions per month chart and conversion timeframe chart to the top. We've moved our webinar conversions title above our KPIs, and now we've given those KPIs the whole row, right? They're really important numbers that our stakeholders care about, so we want to make sure that they have their, whole, their own section. And then we've taken our filters out of that side container, and we've put them across the top for now. It's still a little crowded, so later on, uh, we're going to get into how we can kind of clean that up a little bit. Here's just another quick example of an employee turnover dashboard. Uh, on the left-hand side, we, we have uh, an older version of probably what not to do. And on the right hand, we have uh, an updated version using those key concepts uh, for order by importance. What I really like about this one, right, we've definitely moved the KPIs to the top. On the right-hand side, they don't look right. But what we've done is each section, each column going down, answers a different type of turnover question. So we've actually grouped our charts together based off of the question that they're answering about turnover. So we have a when turnover column is happening. We have a who is turnover column happening too. And then we have a why is turnover happening column. So I really like organizing the charts like that rather than just having them you know, be all over the place with no type of organization or meaning. Another quick example here, uh, what I want to point out in this one uh, is the top 10 states by amount uh, and the small spark lines that we're seeing on the left-hand side. What we've done is we've actually consolidated them into one chart on the top right. So rather than having a repeat of uh, headers, uh, we've combined it into a much smaller chart, which allows us to expand our map and some other things in a different way to give a little bit more room to some other charts. So I really like how uh, we've been able to combine those two charts into one and, and kind of uh, consolidate our headers. So definitely something that you might want to consider, especially if you're you're always looking at um, you know a top ten or something throughout your your dashboards. Number two, format font. Here are key concepts. I'm definitely going to go into more detail about the chart on the right, so um, we'll skip over that for now. But we want one font type throughout our dashboard. We need to verify if that selected font works with Tableau Cloud, if applicable. We need to use bold text sparingly for emphasis, limit our font sizes, and use legible fonts. So one font type. If we take a look at this dashboard, we have a mix of Tableau fonts and Arial and Times New Roman. So it's kind of all over the place. Uh, what we want to do is find one font type that works uh, throughout the whole dashboard. From there, it's OK to have different styles of that font. Maybe we're italicizing it here and there for emphasis, or we're using bolds. Um, but we want to make sure that we're sticking to one font type throughout the whole dashboard. Then we need to verify that that selected font type is applicable uh, with Tableau Cloud or Tableau Public if we're doing some things on there. Uh, this information on this slide comes directly from Tableau's website. Some of these fonts do need to be installed locally, um, but it's important to point out that although Tableau gives us a whole list of really creative fonts uh, across different operating systems and across uh, Tableau Cloud and Tableau Public, 
uh, right? We're kind of limited to only about 12 or 14 fonts here. Uh, I think the Fleur Lidge twins had an article come out recently that talks about or really dives deep into Tableau, um, all the different font options uh, and what's supported. And I think at the end of their article, they say, first and foremost, uh, use Tableau fonts. They are the most 100% uh, font that will render correctly across all different operating systems uh, and across all different Tableau products. So when in doubt, use the Tableau fonts. From there, use common fonts such as uh, Courier New, Times New Roman, Arial. Arial is my go-to, uh, so that's what, what I choose to use. So um, you know, we just want to make sure that the way that we're designing our dashboard will, with our fonts will stay consistent no matter who's opening the dashboard in different uh, formats or operating systems. From there, we want to use bold text sparingly for emphasis. So it's totally okay to use bold in our KPIs or our title or, or maybe to highlight a certain object on a chart, but we don't want to use it uh, too much, right? Because then it gets to be a little bit distracting where our eyes start to, to move around to those really bolded texts. So here, we just have our title and KPIs uh, bolded, which I think is okay. Um, but we're actually going to update this and, and we'll see why just removing the bold just looks a little bit cleaner with the rest of the updates that we're going to make to our dashboard. Finally, limit our font sizes. So these are the font sizes I recommend for different types of things. So dashboard titles, 22 to 28, worksheet titles, 11 to 14, chart headers, 9 to 10, and additional text, 8 to 10. When I uh, list those ranges, though, for worksheet titles, I don't mean that it's okay for a worksheet title here to be 11, another worksheet title to be size 13. We want to pick one and just stick with it. So uh, we should have no more than different uh, no more than four font sizes per dashboard. And finally, um, the last point I want to add is use legible fonts. No one wants to see your dashboard in Broadway or Papyrus or anything like that. Uh, right? We just want to make sure that the information that we're displaying is legible. If we're doing something creative on Tableau Public, then sure, it's okay to get a little bit creative, but we still want to make sure that people are able to read uh, the information that we're displaying. So if we apply all these key concepts to our dashboard, this is what an update could look like. So now we're using Arial throughout the whole dashboard. Uh, we have, we've unbolded our KPIs and our title, and it just, it blends a little bit more into the dashboard, which I like. It's not, um, you know, making, it's not too heavy on our eyes with that extra bold. Another quick update uh, to another dashboard. So here we have our hotel manager dashboard. Going down the left-hand side, I, I want to point out that the gray that we've chosen for those KPIs in the panel, uh, the, the gray color is a little bit uh, too close to the background gray that we have. So it's really important to make sure that the font size and color that we're choosing is accessible. There's generators uh, on the internet that we can run through, um, that we can put our font size and color and background color through, and it will spit out some information that says this is accessible or not, and it will tell you how to update that. So it's really um, good to get in the habit of checking that, especially if you're not sure if what you've chosen is readable. So uh, on the right-hand side, we've updated our dashboard where we're using the same font types throughout. We're using bolds uh, sparingly. Uh, and we've just really standardized the, the four font sizes that we've chosen throughout the dashboard. Number three, use color consistently. So if you're stuck, uh, it's always great to just design in grayscale first and then start to add color. Uh, from there, when we start to add color, we want to use one or two dominant colors. And these dominant colors can be shown to um, you know, split out positive and negative values or to separate categorical values. From there, we want to be consistent within and across the dashboard while using color. Uh, it's important to draw from brand colors with custom color palettes. And then we also want to make sure, just like our fonts, that we're ensuring accessibility for color blindness. So first, design in grayscale. Uh, I think adding color to our dashboard is always one of the most difficult things, uh, especially if we struggle with what color palettes look great. So uh, I typically start in grayscale, and then I go through the dashboard and start to add color. Uh, just for emphasis here and there and, and figure out where it works best. When I start to add color though, I stick to one to two dominant colors. So uh, in this one, I've chosen to go with the dark blue throughout the dashboard. Uh, and you can see that that dark blue has chosen uh, or was chosen to highlight the um, box on the left-hand side. I've used it in my logo for highlighting in my icon. So I've, I've chosen that dark blue color uh, throughout to form the basis of my dashboard. From there, I want to make sure I'm being consistent within and across the dashboard with my colors. So let's take a look at those four charts. Uh, 
first, the top left-hand side of the area chart. The height of the area chart communicates the value. So I know as, as the area chart gets taller that my value is increasing. But I also have that measure on color on the marks card, which is a little bit repetitive. So as it gets darker, the value gets higher. We don't need to do this. Uh, we don't need to, same thing with bar charts. I see this happen a lot where we, uh, you know, the, the height or the, the length of the bar communicates how much the value is, but we also add it to color. So we're just being a little bit repetitive. So uh, we don't need to do that. We can take the, the color off of, um, the measure off of the color on Mark's card. The chart on the right, we all know about green and red. So let's just avoid this. But what I do like about this chart is my highest value is colored a different color. So we're using color for emphasis there, but we just didn't choose the right colors in this scenario. And then on the left, the bottom left-hand side, my conversions per webinar, we are, we've seen the pie chart that has eight different pieces in it or more, and we've colored all of them a different color. We do not need to do this. So let's just stick with one color throughout a bar chart or similar to the one in the top right, we color the highest value a different color. And then on the right-hand side, my bottom right, my client's business unit chart, uh, right? Nothing seems to be wrong with this one, but the problem I have with it is what does blue mean? We have blue in the top left chart, we have blue in the, the bottom left chart, and then we have blue on the right. So we're just not saying consistent with our color throughout the dashboard. Next, draw from brand colors with custom color palettes. Every organization, every stakeholder, client, they have some type of approved marketing guide that lists their brand colors. Same with their fonts and logos. Um, so we wanna leverage that information and bring it into our dashboards, right? It's a really important to brand our dashboards so they look like a product, right? We all have um, you know, email signatures and things like that. So we wanna brand it to, to look like something that's for our organization or for our client. So we, I have the Lovelytics primary company colors on the left and our secondary company colors on the right. I've chosen to go with the dark blue and now that forms the basis of my dashboard. So right, same same case in point with the, the one to two dominant colors. Uh, I've let this be the dominant color throughout the dashboard and then I've chosen another lighter gray color to act as my backup secondary color. Let's say I wanted to add uh, another dominant color in here, maybe the orange or the yellow. Uh, I can do that, but I really want to use it sparingly. Maybe I'm just using it here or there just to highlight one small little thing, um, but I don't want it to, to compete with my other dominant color that I've chosen. And finally, I just want to point out the accessibility for color blindness. Similar to font types, we can add uh, export images of our dashboard through different color blindness generators so we can see if the colors that we've chosen are accessible. So it's definitely important to get into the, the habit of doing that. If we take all of these key concepts and apply it to this dashboard, this is what an updated version could look like. I really like this because we can see how uh, the gray has kind of formed that um, that secondary background color, uh, but then we have the dark blue for emphasis throughout our dashboard. So even in our KPIs, I love how the gray is used for the smaller text and the label where the logo and, or the icon and the KPI itself are actually that uh, dominant blue color. Now, at first glance, the one on the left doesn't look terribly incorrect, right? The color balance is actually pretty good there, but the problem is I don't know what purple means. Does purple mean my south sales or does it look at my sales trend in the central region? I'm not exactly sure what purple means. So what we've done to update this on the right is we've added, uh, added a small little uh, text that says orange indicates poor performance. So now I know that no matter where I'm looking throughout my dashboard, that anywhere that I see orange, that's a poor performing category or sales trend over time. So I really like using it in this way. If we didn't want to do that and we just wanted to color each um, each region a different color, this is what that would look like. Now we're using yellow consistently throughout the whole dashboard to highlight my west region. And I know that everywhere that I see red, I'm going to be looking at my east region. So um, I really like this dashboard, uh, just like the differences between the two of them and, and how we can use it to show uh, positive and negative values or for categorical uh, dimensions. Number four, adjust padding and white space. Here are key concepts. So use padding for white space to separate our thoughts or topics. Group our charts together by using the same background color. Add borders to charts or containers to grab our user's attention. And add at least 10 pixels of inner padding on charts. 
Uh, so first, when I talk about padding, we can find that on the layout tab while building a dashboard. There's options there for outer padding and inner padding. And depending on what you're doing, uh, we'll determine which one you, you should use. Uh, but definitely always add 10 pixels of inner padding to charts. So if we take a look at this dashboard, we can see how bumped up everything is to each other. So on the left hand side on the panel, my font or my, my text is really up against the edge of my dashboard. There's really no separation between my charts uh, on the inside of my dashboard. Everything is bumped up to the blue panel and my charts are all right next to each other. So just to create some nice white balance and spacing throughout my charts, that's where I can start to add outer padding and inner padding. So everywhere I have an arrow is probably where we would want to add uh, so many pixels of padding to kind of create that separation. If you don't want to use padding, you can totally use blanks too. We can drag a blank object to kind of create the separation between our charts. Add borders to charts or containers to grab users' attention. Now, I know some people are going to think about this and say, why would you add borders? Well, when I say add borders, I don't mean a really dark border. That's just going to be really distracting to the eyes of the user. So if we want to group things just to say like, hey, all these charts are related together, we could probably use a light gray background or a light gray uh, container. Uh, I like to do that with my KPIs, or if I have three or four charts that are all related, you know, maybe I'll put them in a container and use that light gray uh, border just to say, hey, all these are related. And it's not distracting, but it's enough to show my user that, hey, all of these are related. And then group charts together by using the same background color. So going down the left-hand side, I have some just supporting information that I didn't want to include in the main part of my dashboard, but I want to keep it there just so it's some extra added information for my user. Uh, so there we're looking at upcoming and previous webinars. Uh, and what I've done is I've just used the blue dominant color as uh, the background color for that dashboard or for that area. Uh, and then it's just you know telling my user that, hey, this is a little bit separated from the rest of the data, but here's some great supporting information if you need it. And then I've used different shadings of that blue just to, to make the different sections within that side panel. So if we take all of these uh, different uh, key concepts and add them to the dashboard, this is what we, we could uh, see as an update. So what I wanna point out here is the light gray background color that we've added. I think I see this a lot on a lot uh, like modern or uh, business dashboards or things like that. Uh, I like the light gray background and then the white worksheet because it really makes the worksheet kind of pop off the background a little bit. And then from there, what we've done is we've uh, different from the different gray from the background, we've just done a slightly darker gray border on the charts. We've added the the pixels so it brings it in, uh, the inner padding pixel so it brings it in from the the border of that worksheet. And I just think it creates this nice contract between the the dashboard background and the worksheet itself. Um, I know if Chantilly was listening to this, who's my boss, uh, she would say, if it's already light gray, why not just use white? Uh, I think it comes down to everybody's preference. Um, I typically like uh, using the light gray. I know she would always choose to use white. So um, you just need to choose what works best for you. But, uh, you know, you don't want to use a background that's too dark and, uh, you know, just wouldn't contrast well with your charts. Uh, just another quick example here. So on the left-hand side, probably, you know, not too many uh, of our worksheets are, are nicely spaced out, not too much white space. We're on the right-hand side, we've actually brought in a background image, but the same concepts apply. So we still want to make sure that we have that spacing between our charts. We have, you know, kind of that nice border that kind of separates our thoughts and ideas. Uh, and then, um, you know, just continuing to add the, the spacing and white space to, to balance out the, our charts. All right, Kate, want to take over with Clear the Clutter? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Eric. So continuing down the path, we are thinking about clearing the clutter. Our key concepts here, labeling all marks are showing axes, not both, deciding whether headers are needed, removing grid lines, borders, or any other formatting that doesn't add clarity, using fewer shapes, and formatting our tooltips. Let's dive in. Within Tableau, there is an idea that we would refer to as encoding, how we are translating the actual data into visual elements in our dashboard. In this particular case, when we're thinking about clearing the clutter, specifically I wanna point out the idea of either showing mark labels or axes. If we are choosing to show both, like what we're seeing at the bottom left bar chart here, we are going to end up having redundant encoding where we're showing the exact same information twice. This is 
excessive and our end users don't actually need to see this information twice in order to understand what's happening. So rather than making things simpler for them, we're making things more difficult. Now, there are certainly always going to be exceptions to this rule, like with highlight tables, where we'd be putting the same measure onto color and onto text. But for the most part, we'd want to avoid redundant encoding whenever possible. In addition, we want to think about reducing the clutter in our dashboards that comes from the formatting that Tableau will apply by default, things like grid lines and borders. Removing these or making them much lighter than Tableau would by default is actually going to help our eyes focus on what is important instead of getting distracted by things in the background. When it comes to using fewer shapes and icons, I've shown an example here of what not to do with icons, where we see icons that are very complex. They have multiple colors. Some of them appear almost three-dimensional. We want to avoid doing this in our dashboards. The website that I would recommend to y'all as a resource is called flaticon.com. If you uh, actually give credit to the creators of the icons, you can actually use them completely for free in your dashboards. And they have a repository of probably millions of icons. So would absolutely recommend finding icons there with the goal of finding an icon that is extremely simple and only has one color to it. Last but not least thought here is that we want to format our tooltips. Tooltips are probably the number one area that I see folks sleeping on when they go to publish their dashboards. They've updated their charts. They've updated all of the different elements visually that Eric covered previously. Things are looking great, slick, and then they go to publish their dashboard and their end users hover over a, per a particular mark in the view and they get something like this where they see a whole long list of basically a mess, including things like any weird design hacky calculations that we've used, um, things like you know quotation marks as placeholders or min zeros as placeholders, or table calculations that read along the lines of rank along table down. This is really overwhelming for our end users to make sense of. So we absolutely want to take the time to format our tooltips. The recommendation that I would give for y'all is something like this, where we're actually phrasing our tooltips as English sentences. That way our end users can spend as little mental effort as possible trying to understand the detail level information that we want to communicate. In this case, for example, we're giving them an English sentence that reads our three simple tips webinar on the date that the webinar occurred had 87 attendees, and 87 conversions. Super simple and easy for my end user to perceive the information that is most important about that particular mark in the view. The last little example that I wanna point out here in terms of clearing the clutter, on the left-hand side, I wanna focus at that scatter plot in the bottom right. In this particular case, we have labeled every single mark. We are showing our mark axes. We have those really thick, grid lines that Tableau provides to us when we create scatter plots out of the box. And we're doing a lot with color here. We want to simplify as much as possible. So what we're seeing is the view on the right where we've removed all of those additional elements and instead are using color to signify the differences in terms of the dimension that we are emphasizing here. So just another example of ways that clearing the clutter can make it infinitely easier for our end users to perceive what's most important. Our sixth topic that we want to consider here in our checklist is leveraging containers. When we're thinking about leveraging containers, containers will allow us to easily group content together and manage formatting. We can get really creative with showing and hiding certain content via containers. We can decide whether or not the content needs to be shown continuously or if it can be hidden. We will be mindful of container hierarchies and we can take advantage of a relatively new feature and function in Tableau known as dynamic zone visibility. In terms of formatting, containers allow us to easily group content together to manage spacing and formatting. 
I'm sure everyone has had an experience at some point in their dashboard creation cycle where they had to fiddle extensively with the size, maybe the width or the height of a particular object in a dashboard, um, trying to fit things directly next to each other and, and making sure, you know, is it 48 pixels? Is it 50 pixels? We can save ourselves a lot of time, stress, and effort by putting a but by putting content that goes together in a container and using that drop down option on the container to distribute contents evenly. This takes away the guesswork and the fiddling of making sizing the same and will actually have Tableau spread all of the content within that container evenly across the view. We can also use containers to show and hide content dynamically. This is an extremely easy way for us to buy back some real estate on our dashboard. So instead of having content show all of the time, it can just be shown at the moment that our end users need it. In this particular case, I am putting the filters into a container that will be hidden, as well as this detailed text table view at the bottom of the dashboard. What this will look like is this. So instead of having that content shown all the time, instead the content will only be revealed when our end user either clicks on the filter funnel icon or the detailed text table icon. In this particular case, we are able to see that detailed view when we click on that table icon. This not only gives us more real estate to show the text table, but it also will help with performance. The reason for this is because Tableau containers use lazy loading, meaning that the content inside of a hidden container is only rendered when the content is exposed, when the show button is clicked in the dashboard. This is going to improve performance instead of having to have Tableau render this initial dashboard with this detailed text table that maybe has thousands of marks in it at the time that our end user would open the dashboard for the first time. Instead, it's only going to show when they click that detailed button. We also want to start to be mindful of container hierarchies. It can get easy when we are using containers to get sort of lost in the inception of containers, a container inside of a container inside of another container. We can easily manage our content hierarchy from the layout pane of our dashboard using the item hierarchy in the bottom left. When we click or select a piece of content in the item hierarchy, it will actually get highlighted in the view. And we see that happening right now. I've clicked our navigation buttons in the item hierarchy and those buttons, that container that the buttons are in is getting highlighted in dark blue in our dashboard. We also have the opportunity to rename content in our item hierarchy to make it easier for us to find that content in the future. So rather than it saying something like horizontal container, vertical container, blank, blank, text object, blank, so on and so forth, we can actually name the containers and content what they actually reflect in the dashboard. In terms of working with containers, we also want to be mindful of a scenario in which we end up with the 90s infomercial for Tupperware, where we have so many containers that it actually slows down performance. Containers can be extremely helpful in, help in allowing us to manage the organization and formatting, as we've discussed, but having too many containers will slow down our dashboard as it loads and renders. So I recommend making sure that any containers that we are using are absolutely necessary and serving a specific purpose. The last concept that I wanna cover around containers is a new feature that Tableau released uh, maybe within the last six months called dynamic zone visibility. With dynamic zone visibility, we have the opportunity to parameterize access to the content not only in a specific worksheet, but within an entire container. The way that we would do this is by first creating a parameter that has the values that we are interested in um, making dynamic. In this particular case, I've created a parameter called region parameter that has four values, west, central, east, and south. 
I have then created a calculated field that corresponds to every one of those individual values, i.e. region parameter equals west. In this case, I'm using that field on level of detail on a specific worksheet. But I now have the opportunity when I select the entire container in the dashboard to make that entire container's visibility dependent upon that single calculated value. So in looking at the GIF here, we again see that single calculated value on level of detail. And now when I select the entire container, I can from the layout pane control the visibility using that specific value. Now when I would select a certain mark in my dashboard, that mark value, in this case the West region, would cause that to show for the entire container. So an improvement upon the previous way of doing things with parameter actions where we could simply select or hide individual content on a single worksheet, we can now control entire containers, things like multiple worksheets, legends, filters, et cetera, based on the presence of that single value calculation for that parameter. Last little example here in terms of what happens when we bring it all together. Again, we see this much cleaner version of the dashboard where things are less cluttered and we are giving more real estate to what matters most and only giving our end users the ability to see that additional content when they would select the show or hide button in the dashboard. Last example here of um, containers with show hide buttons. We're seeing on the left, expanding that filter menu by using a show hide button with filter containers. And on the right, we're actually seeing sheet swapping happening where my end users, it would appear to them as though they are toggling between two different views. But really what's happening is that they are clicking a show hide button that expands the highlight table when the container is shown. Concept number seven, apply interactivity effectively. In this check, we are verifying that dashboard actions are not competing with one another. We can think about sequencing interactivity, such as using filter actions where the uh, clearing the selection removes the filtered values from the view to drill down in our dashboards. We wanna make sure that our interaction is clearly explained in instructions or titles so our end users know exactly how they can take advantage of dashboard actions. We want to be mindful when naming dashboard actions so that they can be easier for us to edit should we need to make changes to them in the future. In this particular example, what we want to have happen is for an end user to select a mark in the map and for the bottom chart to be highlighted while all the charts on the right hand side are filtered. What we end up with here, because we are using that out of the box uses filter action, is a conflict in terms of the objects of the filter action in the dashboard. In this case, we are going to edit this filter action to remove the bar chart at the bottom, and we are going to choose to keep filtered values for the charts on the right. Now when we select a mark, in this case a city in our map, our bar chart at the bottom, the highlight action is able to run, and when we clear the selection, the dashboard stays filtered on the right-hand side. So just double checking that our actions are not in competition with each other is going to make it much easier for our end users to navigate through the dashboard. Step number eight is considering navigation methods. In terms of navigation methods, what we're really getting at is a scenario in which we have multiple dashboards that our end users need to see. Do we want to use buttons to have them navigate between dashboards, dashboard actions, or do we want to show sheets as tabs? If we show sheets as tabs, we will want to name the tabs intuitively to make navigation easier because whatever the tab is named is exactly what it will show up as when we publish that dashboard. We can also think about some ideas around using landing pages to help our end users navigate between dashboards. And we can also use navigation buttons for additional interactivity like sheet swapping that would mimic that functionality that we were seeing with parameter actions or dynamic zone visibility or hidden containers. 
In terms of considering navigation methods, in this case, we've decided to use navigation buttons to help our end users navigate between dashboards. What we're seeing here is some clever formatting to help our end users identify which dashboard they are currently navigated to. So the way that we've done this is that every single dashboard has the exact same buttons on it. What we see, for example, on the left with the executive summary or the sales rep dashboard. And all we're doing is changing the color of those buttons as they appear on each subsequent dashboard. That way, when our end users actually click on the button and are navigated to that secondary dashboard, the color will change and the button will look as though it is selected. If we decide that we want to use show sheets as tabs to navigate with dashboards when they are published, we want to make sure that we have named our tabs something intuitive because, again, this is exactly what our end users will see if those sheets are shown when we publish. So in this case, rather than having this be called Dashboard 3 Version Final, instead I'm calling it Sales Executive Summary because that's what my end users would perceive as something beneficial or helpful. They would clearly know what this dashboard is about. The thing to note around showing sheets as tabs is that there is a little bit of a performance lag or a performance knock when using that option. So whenever possible, I would recommend using navigation buttons or dashboard actions to navigate between dashboards as you will get a little bit of performance improvement over showing sheets as tabs. In terms of additional ways that we could think about helping guide our end users through multiple dashboards, Landing pages are a fantastic way that we can do this. Landing pages allow us to provide high level information as well as any important instructions to our end users before they would actually get into the specific dashboards for their analysis. A couple of great examples with landing pages here. On the left, we have a landing page that actually has interactivity built into it that would filter the subsequent dashboards that our end users would navigate to. With the one on the right, we're using a call to action dash, uh, we're using a call to action navigation button that would allow them to click and be taken to the first dashboard in the series. Some further examples on the one on the left, we have navigation buttons where each one of these separate six buttons takes them to a different dashboard. And the one on the right, one of my personal favorites here, not only are we providing high level information, but we are also including some actual charts and graphs in the bottom half of this landing page. That way, if our end users were just looking for high level information, they might not even need to navigate to the specific dashboards or subsequent dashboards in the view. Instead, they may be able to just bookmark this landing page and get the high level information that they need. The last example here, and this is actually a dashboard that is available in the Tableau Exchange. In this particular case, we're using worksheets and parameter actions uh, to navigate our end users between Fund B and Fund D. But we could have set up this dashboard to actually use navigation buttons for Fund B and Fund D. Under the hood, we would have two complete exact replicas of this dashboard where all that was changing were the specific sheets in the view so that when our end users would click on a navigation button called Fund B, they would perceive the values as being filtered. But really what would be happening is going from Dashboard 1, aka Fund B, to Dashboard 2, aka Fund D. So just another way that we could use navigation buttons for some sheet swapping uh, interactivity in a similar way that we could use containers and hidden containers or uh, dynamic zone visibility to achieve the same. Number nine is building trust in the data. Super important that our end users can feel confident that the data that they are seeing is accurate because ultimately if they don't trust that the data that they are seeing is up to date or is accurate, they are not going to use the dashboard and they will simply find the answers they're looking for in that source data system. So some key concepts here, maybe providing the opportunity to download summary or detail level data, making sure that we are showing the data refresh cadence, 
and we are including the dashboard and data owners. Providing the ability to download summary or detail level data can be really beneficial in helping end users feel like they have the opportunity to cross check specific values or reference those values against some known values in order to validate that the data that they're seeing is up to date and accurate. In this particular dashboard, we're not providing the ability to download the data necessarily. Instead, we've given our end users the ability to download a PDF or an image of the dashboard but we absolutely could include a button in the top right that would allow them to download, again, either summary or detail level data from this dashboard. A thing to note is that if you are going to take advantage of the out of the box download data options for your end users, either by having them click a mark and have the command button that appears to allow them to view the data or using the download data button when the dashboard is published in Tableau Server or Tableau Cloud, the ability to download detailed data is limited to the actual license type that an end user has. If they're assigned a creator and explorer role, they will be able to download detailed data, but viewers will only ever be able to download summary data. And this isn't a permissioning thing. This is just based on the license capabilities. In terms of showing the data refresh cadence on every dashboard and including the dashboard and data owner, Doing this is going to help our end users feel much more confident that the data that they are seeing is up to date and accurate. For example, if our end user was expecting that the values would be higher because maybe they just put in some new data a few hours ago, if they look at the dashboard and see that the dashboard is only refreshing on a daily basis and not an hourly basis, they would be able to better reconcile the fact that the data that they are seeing in the dashboard may not reflect the new actions that they've taken. Including the dashboard and data owner allows our end users to not have that feeling that they are shouting into the void and instead gives them the opportunity to know exactly who to contact if they are having issues with either the data or the dashboard itself. So in a final example here on the left, we're not including that information. On the right, we are including it in the footnote at the bottom of the dashboard. Back to you, Eric. Awesome, thank you so much, Kate. Um, so let's take it home with number 10, save time and templatize. Here are key concepts, uh, leverage simple layouts that are easy to follow, increase adoption through consistent design, and brand your dashboards using your organization style guide. So earlier we talked about using our brand colors. Again, just to reiterate this point, we wanna make sure that the designs that we're using in our dashboard are similar to what our organization is putting out. So we want our dashboards to look like they're a part of our organizations or whoever we're designing the dashboard for. In the top right, we just have a quick example of a dashboard layout that you could use. Um, so when we talk about templatizing, right, I believe the phrase is if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So if we find a dashboard design that works, that people like, uh, and it's user friendly, then use that over and over again. So what we can do is we can save that dashboard as a template, remove the data, remove the worksheets from it, and circulate that throughout an organization as starter templates. So it's really great to get in the habit of building out a few different templates that users can use. So thinking about keeping our KPIs across the top or bottom, designing to a grid. So what does a four chart dashboard look like? What does a, a three chart dashboard look like? And kind of creating those uh, sections on the dashboard to create that template. So you can see on the right hand side, we have an option for three navigation buttons. We have uh, the different layouts of where different sections of our charts are gonna go. Uh, so kind of creating like a template like this uh, can really start to standardize your dashboards throughout your organization, but it's also a great tool for users that are new to Tableau that might not have strong dashboarding development skills that can build the worksheets and work with the data, but uh, creating a you know user friendly design can be a little challenging. So giving them something to already work of work off of, um, you know, can can help um, you know get them to that next uh, level with their their dashboards. And then again, if we have a consistent design, always knowing that my filters are going to be in a certain you know side panel, or I always know where my logo is going to be or where my download buttons go. Cre uh, we create better adoption by just having that consistent design throughout our dashboard. So if we do this, um, you know, overall we'll be able to to drive more usability to our dashboards and increase um, and and increase usability and and have better business decisions come out of that. 
All right, so just another quick example, two totally different data sets, right? One looking at credit union data and the other one looking at insurance agency data. Uh, but you can see here that we're following the same type of style uh, and, and template that we have. So KPIs and bar charts going down the left-hand side. The map is forming the basis of our dashboard. We have about four charts here. So we're kind of doing like a two by two grid. Uh, our title and our icons are kind of all in the same spot. So uh, maybe a little bit of differences between the two, but we can kind of see how one design worked for one. Uh, and then even though it's totally different data, we're just repeating that design. Same thing in this one, looking at COVID-19 and HR data, and then also looking at our sales data. But we're creating that brand with our, our Lovelytics style here. So all of our titles and subtitles look the same. KPIs in the background look the same. Uh, and then we have that side paneling that has the same type of refresh date, as well as that supporting information going down the side. And we're, we're still designing to a two by two grid. So I really like this one because, again, it's two totally different data sets, but we're really starting to create that brand with our dashboards. Again, uh, just another example here of these are our more of background images that we can use as templates. So if we want to give our dashboards more of that modern look, we can bring in a floating image uh, or, or an image uh, and tile that to our dashboards and kind of float our worksheets on top of it. So that allows us to add things like drop shadows and, and kind of do things in a, a different and more modern way. But again, same type of thing. We can create templates based off of those. So uh, you know, we can use Figma or we can use Adobe Illustrator or PowerPoint, whatever our, our tool of choice is, and then bring them in and create a bunch of templates within Tableau. So let's put it all together. So if we're able to take our dashboards through these 10 steps, again, we went through all those key concepts. Uh, they don't apply to every single dashboard, depending on who our audience is and what the data is. But it's really important to just double check and make sure that we're applying those key concepts where applicable. If we're able to do that and we go through each one of these 10 steps, then what we, we should be able to do is take a dashboard like this on the left and produce something on the right. So I think we can see you know, the main differences between what we're seeing on the left versus the right. The left is great, not terrible, um, you know, still works. But again, just like I said in the beginning, things are a little bit off. So if we apply those key concepts, we can have something on the right. I think it has a much cleaner finish. It's more consistent with our colors and fonts. Um, you know, it doesn't have too many overcrowding, uh, you know, labels or anything like that. We have some nice show hide options as well as navigation objects and export buttons. So uh, taking it through the 10-step the, the checklist, everybody should be able to do that. You don't need to be a designer. You don't need to be a Tableau visionary or ambassador. No matter where you're at on your Tableau journey, follow those those uh, that, that checklist, and you should be able to have a much better user-friendly design. All right, Kate, do you want to tell the lovely folks what we're sending them home with today? Absolutely. So we are sending you home with two incredible giveaways here. The first is going to be a 10 step checklist that has not only just the overarching 10 steps, but also all of the detailed considerations that you can go through in order to improve the user friendliness of your dashboard design. We're also sending you home with four dashboard templates. Uh, that include a landing page as well as three other dashboard templates that you can immediately use within your organization. Super easy to simply apply your own custom colors to, create your charts, and just simply drag and drop them into that template to get started and be well on your way to more user-friendly design that'll be a lot easier for you to create and for your end users to adopt. In order to get access to those resources, feel free to use the QR code on the right or the URL on the bottom left. All right. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, thank you all for taking some time out of your day to, to watch this recording of our session. Um, if you did watch it and you have any questions or want to give us a shout out or, or any feedback, uh, feel free to reach out to us through email. Um, you could also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, that is my Twitter there. Kate's is just her name at uh, with the at symbol in the beginning. Um, so feel free to shout us out there if you like the session or, or content or have any questions. If you would like to collaborate with us and work with Lovelytics, definitely reach out and we'd be happy to, to set up a conversation. So again, thank you so much for, for joining us here today uh, and, and have a wonderful rest of your day.